You're watching LMCC. Hi, everyone. As Rachel said, my name is Scott Zerby. I was the mayor of Shorewood for eight years. I retired, so to speak, at the end of the uh, last year. And uh, you are absolutely correct. I was telling my friends that I was complaining that Shorewood didn't get enough love in the history of the area. She used the word lamenting. And then she basically said, put your money where your mouth is and come speak to it. So. <laughs> Here I am. I have uh, put together a slideshow of some of the things that I found and I enjoyed learning about Shorewood at the same time and hopefully I can uh, enlighten you on some of the things that have uh, transpired over the years. So my presentation is called We Have Them Surrounded, a, a brief history of Shorewood and I will show you what that means. I'll start with that in 19, or I'm sorry, 1858, the, we were called the township of Excelsior, not the city of Shorewood. So the city of Shorewood has a longer history than you might think. Uh, 19, 1858, it was originally Excelsior, Greenwood, Shorewood, Tonka Bay, parts of Deep Haven, and Orono, as you know. And uh, that's kind of the area there. So we were kind of the uh, farmland for the Excelsior downtown even then, and uh, we grew from there. In 1956, so 65 years ago, we became the village of Shorewood. Our first council meeting was in June of 1956 at the Minnewashta School. I found it interesting, some of the first things they talked about was, guess what, uh, alcohol licensing, 3-2 uh, beer at the time, and tobacco sales, which is interesting. Uh, in March of 1974, we became the city of Shorewood, and we became incorporated. Uh, I've heard through oral history, and I didn't find any real records of it, that Shorewood and, Ex and uh, Greenwood basically became villages at the same time in 1956 over different reasons. That Greenwood actually uh, filed the name Greenwood with the state before Shorewood got a chance. Shorewood wanted to be the, have the name Greenwood, <laughs> but <laughs> the city of Greenwood or the uh, got it first. So Shorewood was sort of our second name. I'd also heard that Greenwood at the time was upset that they couldn't get a liquor license from the city of Excelsior for the Old Log Theater. That was one of the reasons, among others, and they decided to finally incorporate and become their own city so that they, they could get that uh, liquor license. So just a few little stats about Shorewood. People are sometimes surprised because the question I always got was, we don't understand where Shorewood is. It's weird. It's like here, and it's over there, and we go through it, and we come back. Um, I always described it as kind of the, uh, the egg and the yolk, so to speak, that Excelsior is kind of the yolk in the middle and Shorewood kind of surrounds it. We are kind of a big square with those things omitted that's seven miles long and one mile wide. And I don't know what drunk surveyor drew the map, but <laughs> we have this little piece that goes all the way up here to Gale Island as well. So if you go you know, past cruising on your boat, past Big Island, and you see that lovely uh, house up there on Gale Island, that is Shorewood. We also have the Islands of Enchanted and Shady over here, which you have to get to through uh, Minatrista and Mound, uh, which is interesting. That gives us actually uh, two school districts, because this is West Tonka um, Mound School District up here, and two fire departments. We actually have a contract with Mound to provide fire service out there. So that, that makes things a little more challenging sometimes. Uh, Hard to believe, but we actually have 10 cities that we border on. Uh, I have the list here, I had to think about it. So it's Excelsior, Greenwood, Deep Haven, Minnetonka, Chanhassen, Minnetrista, Mound, Tonka Bay, Victoria, and Orono. So we got a lot of neighbors that we uh, need to work with on a regular basis. The uh, 2020 census puts our population at 8,302. So we are what I like to refer to as the tallest midget on the South Lake Minnetonka. <laughs> we have the biggest population and the biggest tax capacity in the area. Uh, Shorewood pays the lion's share or quite a bit of the fire and the police out here, and we're happy to do so. We have 21 staff members and with a five-day-a-week city hours. So I bring that up because these smaller towns can't afford to be open five days a week. A lot of them have uh, four days a week and, and different hours. So we're kind of, again, you know, a little bit, try to be a little more 
standard, I guess, in our in way we handle our city and our municipality. So I touched on the islands a little bit. Minnetonka, as you probably know, in Dakota language means big water. We have Enchanted and Shady Island, which as you might guess, were both used for sacred American ceremonies. Uh, we just are in the process of rebuilding the roads on Enchanted and Shady Island. And uh, you'd be surprised at the number of Indian mounds that were discovered or recognized out there that we had to work with. Um, I was just talking to a friend of mine, Nancy Gang, who's from the islands here, and she was saying she would like to know where those mounds are, just because it's interesting. Uh, they're rather protected. You know, the archaeologists are uh, not very forthcoming on where they are because they just don't want people to get too curious. So, but they are out there. Uh, these are pictures of Gale Island. They uh, built an octagonal house out there and painted it bright red, and it became known as Brightwood as the name of the house. They have a big boathouse out there. And uh, they come and pick up the uh, city uh, building inspector every time they're doing remodeling by boat, bring him out so he can do his inspection and, and come back. So it's kind of a neat little corner of Shorewood that we have. There's also Spray Island, which just went up for sale. The entire island you could buy for, I think, $2.4 million. That used to be a small uh, Boy Scout camp, I think. And if any time I'm wrong, I want to hear it. So if you guys know better than I, I'm here to learn about it, too. Um, some of the history I got on Gale Island was that Harlow Gale, a Minneapolis real estate developer, uh, realized that two acre island off of South Big Island had gone unclaimed and the federal government sold him the island for $2.45 in 1871. He built his summer home there in the late 1870s and uh, eventually sold it to St. Olaf College in 1967 it became a site for retreats before slipping back into private ownership. You knew? You knew them? I've never heard them. You never heard them. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, uh, I was always fascinated when we moved out here 28 years ago at the history, and the, especially the history, as you all know, of the uh, glorious. Uh, resorts that were around the lake. Well, Shorewood had two of those nice resorts. The first that I know was Radisson Inn. Radisson Inn was on Christmas Lake. The Radisson Inn was 17 miles west of Minneapolis, and it was right on the city trolley lines. Uh, it was originally the Glen Morris Inn, built by Glenn, uh, Charles J. Morris. Uh, he was an engineer with the railroad company. In the late 1880s, he built a two-story year-round home and renamed it the Glen Morris Industry. It was described by the uh, tourist paper as one of the most beautiful states in the area. He died in 1906 and his children immediately added rooms and opened it the same year as a, uh, to the public as the Glen Morris Inn with 15 cottages added onto it. I had heard that uh, the Radisson Hotel, at the time there was just one hotel in Minneapolis, was looking for a property out on Lake Minnetonka because their customers kept asking him if they had a property out by Lake Minnetonka. They had heard such nice things about it. And so they purchased the, the uh, property in the early 1920s and renamed it the Radisson Inn. Uh, the proprietor or the general manager, Mrs. Simon Cruz, and her cousin, Belle Basil, renovated and enlarged the main building to include a 240-foot veranda and 40 rooms complemented by a dining room that could seat 250 guests. Uh, the inn hosted Saturday night dances and was a popular spot for Sunday dinner and business functions. In 1934, just after Prohibition ended, the inn was sold to a New York entrepreneur, Lou Cohn, and this guy, he loved to party. He immediately added a liquor license, gambling casino, slot machines, dice tables, and roulette. And I had heard that there were also the ladies of the evening that were around that could be found. Uh, the neighbors hated it, but they didn't have to put up with it for very long. Just before the inn was set to open for the 1936 season, 200 employees from the Maurice Rothschild Company packed the place and carried on till about 2 a.m. And later that morning on the May 3rd, 1936, the housekeeper woke up and smelled smoke. She used sheets and blankets tied together to get her down from the third floor room and ran to the caretaker's home. The Excelsior Fire Department was called out, but the main building could not be saved, and before the morning was over, only two chimneys remained. Uh, uh, all the cottages were saved, and there are at least four still there. So there's a little spot of land out there that we continually have uh, questions about called Lot 11. 
which is uh, sort of a common uh, beach for many of the residents out there that were part of the original property that has a dock on it they can share. Say, hey, Scott? Yeah. The last slide there? I'm going to ask what everybody's wondering. Um, why is there a pterodactyl? In the <laughs> yeah, you know, I saw that on this postcard that I, uh, <laughs> that I stole off the internet. It, it's a plane. But I found another picture of the same postcard without the so-called pterodactyl. So I'm thinking <laughs> there was an internet prankster somewhere that decided to add that. But it, if you look closely, it's kind of like a Wright Brothers plane in some way. But yeah, I, I don't think it's right. <laughs> Good catch. So a little bit about Christmas Lake. Uh, anybody know why it's named Christmas Lake? Nobody knows why it's named Christmas Lake. Nobody. There's one person that did, does know. <laughs> the surveyor, Hennepin County surveyor named Christmas. That's right. It was named for Charles W. Christmas, who was the first county surveyor of Hennepin County. He was elected in 1852, and he also platted the original town of Minneapolis. So when I tell people, uh, as a proud mayor or former mayor, um, how nice Christmas Lake is, I said that uh, Charles Christmas surveyed all the lakes in uh, Hennepin County, and this is the one he put his name on. You know, so that makes it kind of special. You know, he could have put his name, I'm sure, on any one of all those lakes. You have to invent names as you go along, and this is the one he put his name on, so it is named after him. Christmas Lake is a spring-fed lake, about 265 acres. Uh, it crosses, actually, between Hennepin County and Carver County, so the south little, I would say, fifth of the lake is actually in Chanhazen and Carver County. Uh, it's known for exceptional water clarity. Uh, they consider it one of the best water clarity in the metropolitan area. Uh, it is, I said, spring-fed with a sandy bottom, and it becomes very deep. Maximum depth is 87 feet, which is deep for that, uh, forming a depression or, or a basin along the ridge. A number of the houses that are built around it are actually up on a hill and have the, uh, those vertical inculators or motorized carts that go down. Uh, one of the things, Christmas Lake got a, a public launch put in uh, by the DNR. I think it was in the mid-'70s. And the uh, Homeowners Association for Christmas Lake is very active. They actually uh, raised funds to try to keep the zebra mussels from coming into the lake. They spent a lot of money. They hired their own inspectors to go out and inspect every boat they could that went into the lake. Uh, sadly, they still got zebra mussels. Uh, but they continued to monitor boats that are coming in for any invasive species and try to reduce their risk. They've also told me that recently they've been hiring college students to go into the lake and pluck uh, weevils, they're called little bugs, off the milfoil, milfoil weevils. And then they've grown them in aquariums and tanks, put them back into the lake to eat the milfoil, and they claim they've almost completely elim eliminated their milfoil issue out there through these weevils. I've always been a little skeptic when man starts messing with nature that way, and I said, well, what happens with these weevils? And they said, well, once the milfoil's gone, their food supply's gone, and they die. So, so far, it's been successful, and the, they continue to really care for this lake, and they've been fortunate that they're financially able to do that, too. Another hotel is the Hotel Edgewood. This was on Edgewood Road, which is uh, towards Howard's Point Marina, kind of. Uh, faced Spring Park. This was a uh, built by Howard Mann, who had a boarding house and a steamboat. He built the upper lake house on Edgewood Road soon after he bought 400 acres in the area that he called Birch Bluff. In 1877, he sold the inn to W.A. Sampson, who renamed it Rustic Home. He loved the view of the upper lake and the wharf where the steamers stopped. By 1901, he had moved the building further down Edgewood Road along Howard's Point and changed the name to the Edgewood Hotel. In 1906, their new owner was John Christensen. I'm sorry, just Christian. And uh, he uh, took the property over, took the hotel down in 1947. And the rest of the hotel was remodeled into a hotel and he used some of the lumber to make cottages that are on the lakeshore now that are individually owned. So I thought that was kind of nice that the steamboat stopped there and they had a a lovely view of Nancy's house across the bay somewhere, so it was good. 
The other home is interesting. I don't know if any of you remember these. This, this, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. The fifth old home. There you go. This was basically, I was told long ago, it was the Swedish old people's house, home, which it was. It was built in 1927. It was located at uh, 26 500 Edgewood Road, a uh, Swedish retirement home that was modeled after the American Swedish Museum in Philadelphia. In order to live there, you had to belong to a Swedish organization called the Order of the Seafold. Is it close enough? I think. Um, insurance group, and it was built by the Independent Order of this fold for the immigrants who felt a need for fellowship outside religious spheres. So there must have been some, uh, even back then, some controversy around the religious uh, efforts. So the cooking and cleaning and yard work was done by the residents, and there was an infirmary, infirmary on the presence. It, it was bought in 1971 by Melvin McCosh. I don't know if anybody ever met Marvin. Nina, you met him? He was the book collector. He started a bookshop down in Dinkytown, moved his bookshop to a fire station on Seven Corners, and then his book collection continued to grew, grow. So he bought this mansion with 42 rooms and filled it with books. Uh, I remember seeing him in Excelsior. He was kind of a flamboyant guy. He was usually wearing, I can't remember, plaid pants and a striped shirt. I mean, it was kind of a mix and match sort of thing. He'd wear a raccoon hat and a nice guy. He and his sister would walk everywhere. I remember seeing him walking down Seven. I, I, they, they were a very uh, hearty uh, bunch. This is not really showing up well, but you can see that's him with the hallways just lined with books. I know, I remember he had a book sale uh, he was always talking about he and his sister were going to move to Memphis or something, I can't remember, and so he was trying to unload some of the books, but I think they just, there were so many books, I, I don't think they ever got rid of them. Where was the building actually located? Not far from Marty's house now, Mar on, on Edgewood there, just down, it's now become uh, Elmridge Circle, which is a small little cul-de-sac that's in there. Is still there? Nope, the building is torn down. Yeah, even uh, when I was on the council, people would look at this and try to find out if they could buy it so they could keep it in the shape it was and remodel it, but I was told the building had gone too far to really be saved. So it was pretty neat. The Minnetonka Country Club is near my house. I found out that this uh, was actually built in 1916. It was designed by a Scottish gentleman named Tom Bendelow, who designed, uh, over his lifetime, 800 golf courses. Uh, the original owners of this picked this spot because it was close, it was three blocks from the streetcar line, and also the, uh, the northern path up through the lake and towards the north shore of Lake Minnetonka. Um, Tom Bendelow was nicknamed the Johnny Appleseed of American golf uh, <laughs> because he designed so many courses. It was originally designed as a nine-hole golf course and later expanded to a 117-acre, 18-hole par 72 course. The original 47 acres of land came with a complete set of buildings and it was purchased by that group of businessmen to build this golf course. Uh, when the club changed hands in 1958, a major restoration was undertaken. Uh, during the World War II, they only used nine of the holes and they let the other nine holes go uh, whatever, grow over. And so in 1954, they came, restored the 18 hole golf course and reimagined it as an elegant lakeside place of leisure, as they called it. And the project was completed in 1959, and Minnetonka returned to a private country club status the next year. The original clubhouse was nicknamed the Governor's Mansion, which was constructed in 1908. It housed the popular Riviera Supper Club in the 1950s. I don't know if anybody went to that. I, I never heard of it before. I see some nods. Must have been a nice place. A uh, second clubhouse was remodeled the following year, only to be lost to a fire on Thanksgiving in 1962. The final clubhouse, which is the one you see on the screen, was constructed in 1963 with an array of fireproofing precautions after the first two burned down. But then familiar additions were made throughout the last decades, including the gazebo room in 1967, the ivy room in 1970, 
expanded club offices in 1996 and a large deck in 1998, as well as an expansion to the ballroom in 1999. It was sold by the family in 2015 to Mattamy Homes, which was a Canadian developer, after owner Bill Wittrack declared the facility too expensive to operate. Um, I was the mayor at the time and I'd heard that you know, golfing in general had a decline. There wasn't as many people playing it. I know as the area got more and more popular for housing, the price of the land it was also going up, so his taxes were going up, and it, I just don't think he could make it. Um, and I know he was getting on in years as well, and at, at the time I had heard his family wasn't interested in taking over the golf course from him. Um, the new developer named the roads after historical golf terms. My daughter absolutely hates the main road you turn off is called Wooden Cleek, not Creek, but Cleek, which I can't remember. I think it's uh, some part of a, it looks like an old golf club, like a putter. Um, and they left almost half the land open as common space with trails and wildlife. So that was one of the things we insisted. We let them put the houses a little closer together in exchange for you know some nice um, room for trails and wildlife. And it's beautiful if you ever get a chance. There's some great public trails that go through there. And I know there's friends that are bird watchers are constantly taking their binoculars there and finding all kinds of stuff. Famous resident, you guys have heard about this guy before, Peter Gideon, but I like to point him out because he would be a Shore Road resident if he was still alive. Uh, in 1953, he and his wife arrived from Ohio and settled uh, in what became Gideon Bay, as you know. Um, the house is, original house is still standing, and there's a monument to it, you can see, on the side of the road, and the house is right next to it. Um, in 1854, he recorded that he planted one bushel of apple seed and a peck of peach seed. He continued for 14 years and grafted and seeded more than 10,000 apple, peach, pear, plum, and quince trees, but they never came back in the, in the spring. Uh, you might have heard the story. He got one seed from Maine, uh, that a seedling that had withstood the hard Minnesota winters and reproduced in 1868 with the celebrated wealthy apple. One thing I f was curious about was why well, why did he want the apple so bad to grow in Minnesota? What, what was the deal? And I discovered it was to make hard cider. <laughs> it was not to keep the dentist away, or you know, an apple a day keeps the dentist away. And you think about it, back in 1856 or whatever it was, there was not a store you could go to and get your pack of Coors Light or whatever. You had to make your own alcohol. So the apple was an was a, uh, important ingredient in making hard cider. And as you probably know, he uh, started the uh, Fruit Growers Association, which developed into the State Horticultural Society, which then became the Minnesota State Store, uh, Horticultural Society. And uh, they built an experimental fruit farm, which is still there today. It's next to the Arboretum. You go out there, and that's where they still work on trying to find winter hardy fruits, such as grapes and apples. You've heard of all those new apples that come out every year. That is largely to do with Peter Gideon. The other thing I thought was interesting was Yellowstone Trail. You know, I always look at the name of the roads as I travel around the town. I wonder where, where did that name come from? Well, there's a part of a road called Yellowstone Trail. It's just uh, north of Cub. If you go to Cub to past Lake Linden and up to County Road 19, you see Yellowstone Trail. Well, Yellowstone Trail was sort of invented by a bunch of business people in 1912 to try to popularize uh, traveling across country in your newfangled automobile. They wanted to have a place for people to go. So it was basically the first transcontinental automotive highway that went through the upper states. It ran from uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts, through Montana to Yellowstone Park in Wyoming, and all the way to Seattle, Washington. And uh, it was marked often with these yellow rocks. People would just find boulders, and they would paint them yellow. And that would be the indication you were on the right path. They also use metal signs with an arrow that says Yellowstone Trail, and there's one of them there now on the Shorewood Yellowstone Trail. You might notice it as you're driving through. So I thought that was kind of neat. You can see the original path as it went through Excelsior and Shorewood. I don't know about this part, why it, why it would go around. It must have been something in the way, I'm not sure. It didn't do that. It didn't do that. No, it went straight out onto 7th. Okay. Because I'm on Yellowstone Trail. Perfect. And so behind the golf course, you know, the yeah. DOT shut that pass off to get on the seven. Yep. And 
and then they didn't shoot over to the Washington Parkway. Yeah, that's what I remember. So I think that's how that went. I can imagine when a yeah, Siemens demand could read that. And I know Highway 7, when it was built, basically took where the trolley used to run, too, originally. So originally the highway, so to speak, kind of went through downtown Excelsior, and Smith, uh, Smithtown Road was actually Highway 7 right. or, until the mid-50s at some point. So, yep. At that point, it was actually known, I read once, uh, Suicide 7 because of all the twists and turns in Smithtown Road. So. Did you have more on that? Nope. No, I think it was because of the deaths. <laughs> because of the deaths. Yeah, so I expect that. Yeah, that make, would make sense. Yeah, they were So down. Can I have one other thing? Yeah, please. Um, my dad had always said that if you're at Hopkins Crossroads, I don't remember the next time there would have been a red light or a stop sign. But you could go from Hopkins to South Dakota with no stop signs. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know when 7 and 1 and 1 had an intersection of red lights. What year that would have been. So maybe he meant 7 and 1 and 1. You could go west. All the way to South Dakota. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I remember in my time when. Did you find out when? She said no wood was the first stop sign. Stop light. No wood was like the last stoplight heading west. And then after that, it's free. Just put your foot on the pedal and go. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, further down Smithtown Road was uh, Boulder Bridge Farm that you might remember. Boulder Bridge Farm started in 1906 by a gentleman. I, sorry, I have the text on the screen. I usually try to pull it off, but anyways. Uh, he bought this farm, Rose Farm, and built a 10,000 square foot home, which in 1906, I have to imagine, is monstrous. Uh, and a boathouse, he dredged the lagoon, and he added the famous bridge that's there. Uh, it, then it was purchased by George Nelson and Grace Dayton in 1926, and they changed the name to Boulder Bridge. Um, at one point, Boulder Bridge was the largest gentleman's farm on Lake Minnetonka. A gentleman's farm means it was farmed for pleasure rather than profit and was usually overseen by hired farm managers. And a friend of mine, um, Chris and Alan Lose, lived in a house on Smithtown Road that I'm told was the original horse manager's house. So that's, um, you can see that still today. In 19, uh, let's see. I'm sorry, the Daytons were always the first family. So remember, at this time, there's still a lot of vacation homes. People didn't live here year-round. So the Daytons were always the first family to arrive in the lake area in the spring and the last to leave in the fall. And they used two Daytons department store furniture trucks to help move the family in each time. <laughs> the Daytons increased the farm to 800 acres and raised 200 Guernsey cows, 70 Belgian horses, and other livestock, as well, well as all the crops to feed them. It also supplied the milk and cream to the Dayton's department store tea rooms. In 1950, the farm was auctioned off and later subdivided in the 1980s, but the original house is still standing today. So I had seen pictures of the Boulder Bridge under construction. It was interesting. You wonder how they did it. When you see it, it's not that difficult to understand, but they basically built a big mound of dirt, and then they put the boulders up over it with cement, and then dug the dirt back out afterwards, and that's how it is. The, the bridge is still there in part. It's just kind of two arches that kind of come up because they put a marina in there, and the boats were too tall to get under the original bridge. So you can still see half of the original boulder bridge. We have three marinas in Shorewood. I got two information on two of them. Uh, the first is Howard's Point Marina, which was actually started in 1926 by a family. Uh, it's always been a place to go for live bait, fishing accessories, and it's always been sort of this corner store. I know people who've lived in the area. This is the 7-Eleven, so to speak, that the kids would go to to get their candy or their trading cards or whatever it is for years. Um, the dock space and the small store have been at this location since 1926. Jim and Rita Kehoe were the original owners for a, decades, uh, for a decade starting in the mid-60s. Uh, th then it was purchased by nearby residents 
uh, because they kept seeing increased development in the area and they wanted to make sure it stayed in place. Marty Seep, uh, an attorney, put together a group of 25 families. They approached the Kehoes and the purchase was made in 1977. At that point, the name was changed to Howard's Point Marina. In 2019, it was bought by Marty Davis, the owner and president and CEO of Cambria. And uh, I spoke with him after he bought this, trying to give him, you know, look him in the eye and make sure he wasn't going to develop it, so to speak. And uh, he says he, his kids went there when they were young. He thought it was a treasure to the neighborhood, and he wanted to see it remain. Um, I've watched him put money into the building. If, if you drive by it, you might notice. You know, he's rebuilt the, the store. He's rebuilt the little uh, shed next to it. And uh, it seems to be running well. Uh, some of the things I thought was interesting was that there's actually an apartment above the store, which he rents out, which I thought was interesting. I always sort of assumed it was business offices. And at the time, the electric meter served both properties, you know, so which is kind of odd. Usually you have a separate meter for the renter so they can pay their share of the electricity. He did update that, so they do have their own electric bill now. But that's been there for since 1926. We also have the, what's now known as the Shorewood Marina, which was the Shorewood Yacht Club. Uh, this started in 1974. A gentleman named John Cross decided to put a yacht club or a sailboat club, which had originally been the Anson Mace Homestead. Uh, Anson Mace was uh, actually a former mayor of Excelsior. He was mayor from 1960 to 1961, and he owned the uh, Lake Minnetonka Dredging Company at the time. It had 250 feet of shoreline and a retaining wall, so it was a perfect harbor for the sailboats that have deep keels. And to complete the site, they purchased an additional three acres of land. In 1978, they started construction. They used 35-foot uh, long cedar piles that they drove 15 feet down into the lake bottom. They put in an angled, these angled slips that made it easier for sailboats to, uh, to dock. And it was incorporated in uh, 1979. In, in 2006, the Shoreward Yacht Club was purchased by Gabriel Jabor, and he began transitioning it to more power boats, seeing more demand for power boats and less for sailboats. In 2021, this year, he began to remodel, so those angled docks are going away, and they're becoming more square, like this, the more 90 degree angles. They've, they're increasing it by two slips. So it's a different configuration, but not, not a big change in uh, density. The original lighthouse, which I called a model lighthouse, is still here. He told me that his uh, granddaughter, Sophia, asked why the lights didn't work. And so he put money into it and actually relit it, had this glass pane re rebuilt and so on. So it's kind of neat. When he does light it up, it's kind of a neat, neat way to go. Uh, next to it, of course, is the dredging company uh, where they launch the, the barges that do the Excelsior fireworks every year. That's donated uh, by the dredging company. And it was where they used to pull the uh, Minnehaha out until there was some uh, discussion about where to store it. That is what I have uh, on my program. But I am always interested in hearing what you guys know about Shorewood. Yes, questions? Uh, yeah. In 1954, I was one of the two elected constables of the West of Shorewood. Yeah. And we had an election to incorporate Excelsior Township as the city of Hiawatha. <laughs> it failed. <laughs> and I got, I was hanging around that night at the office, and they blamed me and Father Christian, who was the pastor of the Catholic Church, because Father Christian, apparently on the Sunday before the election, expressed his fear that the definition of the church boundaries uh, would be changed and we would lose half of our parishioners. And they think that was enough to change the election. So the election failed. You said it was done at a meeting later. <laughs> Thank you. I had never heard that. I, yeah, of course. Folks, I'm going to stand up. Nina, go ahead. Um, how many here are Sherwood residents? Well, you're lucky. Uh, I was born and bred and lived in Excelsior for many, many, many years. 
And I came to Rotary meetings when asked the uh, this guy here who was mayor. I said, I'm thinking of moving to shore and landings from Excelsior right across Highway 7, you know? And uh, I said, and how is that? And he said, well, give me two weeks. He thought about it for two weeks. I went to the Rotary Club that night, uh, that day, and he said, you made it. <laughs> yeah, I had read about the, the Shore Council uh, constables in the original minutes. So all, all the minutes, for those of you interested in history, for Shorewood are online. We use a system called Laserfiche, so we have them all digitized all the way back to that first meeting in 1956. And it's kind of interesting reading. You can see what's going on there. Um, there's always been discussion about the policing. You know, Shorewood did have their own police force at once, but two members, it was it, you know. Um, we've been able to combine forces, so to speak, and form the South Lake Minnetonka Police Department, which is really a benefit for all of us. I think all the cities get better service than they would normally if they had just tried to form their own force and, and do it. I think you would probably agree with that, uh, Gene. Um, so it's always a question, you know, should these towns merge back together? Um, I thought that was a good idea when I was young and foolish. Uh, over the years, as I've grown, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, everybody, I think, really enjoys having their own neighborhood, their own little, I call it uh, Hobble, Hummel Village, isn't that the little Christmas uh, village set or where Everybody wants to live in that little Christmas village, you know, which I understand, but there are some uh, good economic reasons to get together and, uh, and work together. And we are doing that to a large degree. I, I said we've already merged 80% or something by the fact that we share the same police, the same fire, and more importantly, the same school district. So a lot of it's already combined. Uh, and we still get uh, representation now, each city, by their you know neighborhood by neighborhood. So I think we kind of have the best of all worlds, although I would like to see a, a little more cooperation. I, one of the things that frustrates me, and I'm just getting on my political soapbox here for a second, is we have this a uh, group called the Met Council, Metropolitan Council. Metropolitan Council, as you might know, or they provide our sewer service. That's where it goes when you flush your toilet. It goes to the Metropolitan Council. <laughs> they say that they need five units, so basically five family homes, five apartments, whatever you want to call it, five units per acre in order to make their sewer system break even. So they are pushing all the cities in this area, including Shorewood, Excelsior, and so on, to put more density in so that they can make their sewer system financially solvent, so to speak. And that's difficult because each city is treated as an island, and I don't think it should. I think we should combine some things together. There should be like more of a commercial district, like we love Excelsior's downtown. There should be high density along the highway where there's more you know, traffic there. But it's not considered by the Met Council. So we do have our challenges on how we develop as we grow here. So. I hope that uh, will change at some point. I've tried to champion with the Met Council that they treat us as a, a region or a district, all the cities together. Um, and they said they're considering it. They look at the same way at uh, Marine on the St. Croix Stillwater area, where they have a lot of these small little villages, but they all work together as one community. I talk about we're not, none of our cities are standalone. You know, we don't, Shorewood doesn't have a library. We don't have a movie theater. We don't have the number of restaurants that Excelsior does. But that some towns like uh, Deep Haven, they don't have a gas station, you know? <laughs> Neither does Tonka Bay. They don't have a water system in Deep Haven. We all have our own wells. They don't have a water system, right. We all have our own wells. Oh, that's one little point I was going to bring out. So sometimes, you know, we talk about sort of this gerrymandering about Shorewood. People ask me, like, how did these lines get drawn or something? There's this, this little finger that comes down here. This is the Tonka Bay Shopping Center. And the store, <laughs> right? So when you go around the corner, and Tonka Bay was so nice that they put a giant sign right here saying, welcome to Tonka Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, well, wait a minute. This is all, this is all Shorewood. So the reason I heard this, was, this became Tonka Bay was because the water tower, because they had city water before Shorewood did, and they wanted to stay connected to it. They thought that was important. Um, some of these little pieces that kind of go through Excelsior, I'd heard, they got carved off because of economic reasons. Back in the day, if you didn't pay your taxes, uh, or the, your welfare, I'm sorry, the city was responsible to pay that welfare, you know? So the houses that were kind of in poorer shape or whatever, 
they were like, nope, we'll just give them the shorewood. We don't, <laughs> we, we don't really want those on our side of the fence. Um, some of it had to do with water. You know, some people said, nope, I want to stick, Excelsior has water for 100% of their residents or nearly 100% of their residents. So people said, no, I want to stay with that. I don't want to go to shorewood. So it got a little convoluted, like this stoplight here on Oak Street and 7, you don't know if you can see, there's a little green here. That stoplight's in Shorewood, right across from Excelsior Elementary. So Excelsior gets the bill for this one every time one of the lights burn out. We've got to <laughs> fix it. So Excelsior kind of got the, uh, the cast offs that's for some of it, you know. I never really figured out this one, why the island got split in half, but you know, you can see it's just a straight line. The surveyor decided to draw up there. So we we're rebuilding the roads, as I mentioned out here. And you can't believe how mad these guys are because they rebuilt their road a couple of years ago and now we're bringing all this equipment down to fix our roads. And they're like, <laughs> why are you gonna wreck our nice shiny roads? We're like, that's how it works. So it's, uh, it's an interesting history, but I think it's a good one. I've been proud to be, to be a Shorewood resident. Shorewood, you know, I think has contributed a lot to the area. We have, a, like I said, a large number of parks. If your kids have played soccer or, or uh, baseball, if they, they played in Shorewood. You know, there's just not that many parks around anywhere else. Um, the trail system's beautiful. We love the LRT trail. And one of the other things is, this is a silly thing too. So here's the LRT trail that goes, this little part right here through uh, Tonka Bay. In the winter, the city is responsible for plowing the trail, not the county, not Three Rivers Park District. Tonka Bay won't plow this section. <laughs> they say it's not worth it. You know, it's just why, why bother? So we said, well, you know, we'll, we'll do this for you because we're already doing all this. We, we can do this little part too. And they said, well, we want you to sign a liability form in case you wreck our, our, our part of the trail or something. And we said, uh, excuse me? So we never signed the liability form and now we just, you know, hold our nose, cover our eyes, and plow it anyways. So, <laughs> so we are one community. We all have our, you know, our pros and cons, each city. I love every one of these cities. I love being out here. So thank you, everybody. I'm glad. I appreciate your time.